Ah oui. Okay. Yep. Um, um, well, um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Lati. Um, uh, thanks, everyone. Um, I I am sorry to inform you that uh, you are here with another, um, having to get used to another foreign accent. Uh, this one is uh, Spanglish, as you can tell. Um, uh, hopefully, it won't get too much on the way. Uh, because uh, because my colleague uh, uh, Professor Bogre uh, mentioned the, the the fact that um, the campus has been looking so beautiful, I thought I had a couple of uh, pictures here. I thought of uh, showing you quickly what our campus looked like about four or five weeks ago, and how it has uh, transformed itself uh, since then. This was about three weeks ago. And uh, this was either two weeks ago or last week. And uh, this is our building. And uh, sorry, no, no, forgive me. Uh, and this is what it is looking like now. Yeah, this is what it is looking like now. Anyway, enough of that. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Professor Bogren uh, mentioned the, the, the title of the of the presentation was uh, ten thousand years of GM food. Um, I would actually write it with a question mark. <laughs> Have we been carrying out uh, ten thousand years of uh, GM food? The origin, sorry, the origin of our crops. Uh, before um, <clears throat> we get on, please allow me a couple of minutes um, about um, our lab. So. Yeah, my name is uh, en Enrique Lopez. I'm, I'm, I'm a Spanish, as you can tell. And what we uh, what we study <clears throat> in our lab is how the world turns green, if you want to put it that way. How leaves develop, and how. Uh, sorry, my setup is misbehaving a little. Um, how leaves develop, and how those leaf cells become uh, full of. Uh, these little organelles, uh, which we call chloroplasts, which of course are the biological version of a solar cell. Uh, plants invented, biology invented solar cells uh, millions of years ago. In fact, about 1.6 million, uh, 1.6 thousand million years ago, 1.6 billion years ago. And uh, biology invented self-constructing solar panels that exposed those uh, solar cells to the light about 450 million years ago. Um, and we are trying to understand how this happens, <clears throat> uh, how basically what what is the equivalent of a, a, a plant stem cell, a plant undifferentiated cell in a, in a pool of stem cells, which uh, plant scientists call a meristem, uh, something that has the genome of the plant but very little of the structures that one would later recognize turns into this or many other types of cells. Uh, this is one single cell of a wheat plant. You have the single nucleus there, there, there. <clears throat> but this is, of course, now, uh, although it's a single cell is lobed, is packed full choco block of chloroplasts. Yeah. And uh, we try to understand uh, uh, chloroplast development. And we are, uh, for this, using primarily genetics. Here you have a plant uh, carrying a mutation which has clearly impaired chloroplast development, but impaired it in a way which it hasn't impaired it completely. It has made it slow. <clears throat> and we do we weird things like uh, what geneticists would call not mutant screens, but suppressor mutant screens. Here you have the same plant mut mutated in a particular uh, uh, gene uh, involved in, in um in early steps in, in plastic development, in proteins getting from the cytosol into the plant. And here you have a double punch, a second punch, which somehow has corrected this plant into looking something much better. Anyway, without getting into <coughs> any more <coughs> of that, uh, the, the, our question today is, have we been carrying out um, 10,000 years of genetically modified uh, or genetic modification 
what is the origin of our crops. And before starting, I wanted to um, ask you to watch, um, I, I will have to uh, speed later, but ask you to watch um, a brief video from um, the Institute on the Environment of the University of Minnesota, which uh, uh, an American plant, science, uh, plant scientist um, uh, raised uh, uh, show, uh, recently as in, in, in a talk of hers, uh, which made me think. So here you have it. Hope you can hear it. Um, I think it takes maybe 10, 15 seconds of breathing to let that sink in. So let's, let's tackle <clears throat> what exactly is genetic modification? To see whether we've been carrying it up. And, and here's a little definition from, from BBT, uh, BBC Bite Size. Yeah, certain enzymes can cut cut pieces of DNA from one organism and join them into the DNA uh, of another organism. Uh, the genes with inserting uh, the new organism with inserted genes uh, have new information for one or more characteristics. So in plants, uh, we do this using a, a bacteria, bacterium, um, a natural genetic engineer. A pathogenic bacterium that uh, causes crown gall, causes tumors in plants, by injecting a little bit of its DNA carried in a plasmid into plant cells. But we have disarmed that bacterium to use it as a carrier of other genes. Uh, we, uh, we've introduced whatever uh, interested bin, uh, bit of DNA that we wanted into um, the vector of that bacterium 
and we transform, we introduce uh, into the genome of, sin, uh, of cells uh, that information. And either those cells are cells that are going to produce a new embryo, or those cells can be regenerated <clears throat> through tissue culture to produce a new plant. That is genetic modification as we know it normally. <clears throat> Have we really been doing this for 10,000 years? Well, clearly not. But have we not been doing something which is pretty similar? Let's have a look. What did we do before? What did we do 20, 30,000 years ago? Well, before farming. You know, as a, as a Spaniard, please allow me to show uh, a little bit of, of cave paintings from northern uh, Spain. Some of the first identified, the first to be identified in the world in the mid uh, 19th century. Uh, um, or from eastern uh, Spain. Our ancestors were in awe of the uh, nature around them. Yeah, these bisons that they hunted, this fish um, that they they fished with with bows and arrows. Uh, those uh, of our uh, ancestors of ours were hunter gatherers, and they needed to move around, uh, following uh, resources. Now, as they moved around, they hunt, uh, hunter gathered, they gathered uh, wild plants. <clears throat> For example, uh, plants which are uh, with nutritious seed uh, of annual plants that, that, let's say, set seed, um, grow in uh, spring, uh, flower in summer, set seed in autumn, and can be collected and uh, brought to come. Of course, some of that seed will um, spill and, uh, and regrow near the camp. And the bulb clicked. Maybe it is possible to do some of uh, this by uh, by ourselves. We don't need to be um, looking for these plants all around. In fact, this image is from I don't know exactly where, but somewhere in northern Africa, uh, about 70 years ago. And very similar processes have been taking place for three, three and a half, four thousand years. <clears throat> This is winnowing, you know, uh, plowing, uh, growing wheat, harvesting it, and af after harvesting it, um, threshing it, separating the grain from the uh, chaff, and then collecting the grain and, and sending the chaff away uh, by being blown by the wind. Yeah. Some of these techniques have not uh, changed in some parts of the world for, for millennia. Now, <clears throat> what happened to us when when we clicked, when we did that. Well, that actually happened in different parts of the world, uh, but one of the first, if not the first part of the world in which it happened is what we call today the Fertile Crescent. What was then the Fertile Crescent? A crescent of land which goes from northern Syria to northern Iraq and in between the Tigris and the Euphrates on one side and into Lebanon, Israel, Palestine on the other side. And this is where uh, plant domestication, the earliest plant domestication took place. And we know this in, in strange ways, in surprising ways. Uh, about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, there was a book about the seven mothers of Europe written by a, a famous geneticist in, in um, Oxford. You know that our uh, DNA, we inherit half-half from our mom and our dad, but we carry a little bit of DNA in our mitochondria. So our mitochondrial DNA is only inherited from our mom. And we know that the populations, the, the ancestral populations of Europe, were the children of seven moms that live in, lived in Southern Europe uh, in the last 40,000 years. <clears throat> two of them lived in, in the Iberian Peninsula, two uh, of them lived in Italy, uh, one of them in, in Greece, one in the Caucasus. <clears throat> why, they were, why were they all southern? Because, you know, glaciations, ice ages, had moved people in and out of the Mediterranean. Uh, so uh, the Mediterranean Peninsula uh, had been refugia, refugia. But there's one of these mums that is the uh, youngest. It lived about 8,000 years ago, and it, li it lived uh, in Syria. And this 
is the one that we believe uh, was, uh, the, if you want, the female uh, component of the line that gave rise to between 30 and 40 percent of the current gene pool of Europe. Uh, well, uh, Europe was a sort of melting pot of three gene pools, uh, the, the early hunter-gatherers, the farmers, which came from the Near East, and a later element that came, that is shared with Native Americans, that came from uh, South Central Asia, and which probably came riding horses. Uh, farming had a huge impact on civilization. Uh, it, it, it gave rise to civilization. It allowed people to settle. It, lay, it uh, led in a few thousand years to uh, rises in population of two orders of magnitude, a hundred thousand, sorry, a hundred times more people uh, about uh, 5,000 BC than there were 15,000 BC because of the development of agriculture. It exploded. And what were the plants that were domesticated? <clears throat> well, today, um, the, the world's three main crops are three uh, cereals, three grasses, in fact, about, uh, plant scientists would say three grasses, uh, wheat, maize, and rice. They provide well over half of the world's calories, just those three plants. We're going to see a, a little bit about the domestication of each of them. Um, a little bit more detail uh, with uh, wheat and maize, very little with rice, as examples of the sorts of things that were done. Where uh, did wheat domestication take place and how? Well, we find this about if we look at its wild cousins. And this was done by um, a Russian geneticist in the mid uh, 20th century. It so happened that the uh, wild cousins of wheat uh, grew in the southern fringes or just south of what was then the, so the Soviet Union, you know, Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, um, south of the Cauc Caucasus, northern Iraq, uh, eastern, uh, southeastern Turkey. And they are these. These are modern wheats, bread wheat, is of course the, the, the wheat with which we make uh, bread, biscuits, etc. Durham wheat. If you buy pasta, next time you buy pasta in the supermarket, look at the ingredients. It will always say Durham wheat or semolina wheat. These are our two main wheats today. Actually, there are older wheats which are still grown, emma and einkorn. Now, when Vavilov, this Russian geneticist, um, identified uh, wheat cousins, he also noted something uh, strange. This was the age of what people call cytogenetics. Using uh, genetics, uh, cyto cytogenetics, um, the arrangements of chromosomes in mitosis to see how similar different organisms were. And cytogeneticists uh, quickly noted that bread wheat has 42 chromosomes, while durum wheat has 20 chromosomes, so does Emma. Funnily enough, this very ancient wheat, which also has uh, wild versions, carries 14 chromosomes, very different numbers of chromosomes. But you will have uh, quickly noticed that these numbers are not accidental, yeah? That's, that's twice 14, and that is three times 14. What's going on here? Well, there are other wild cousins of rel uh, uh, wild relatives of wheat that Babilov identified that are, uh, were called gold grasses and which also have 14 chromosomes. And when doing banding patterns, when looking at those chromosomes in detail, he found, uh, or it was uh, found by others in fact, that they could be grouped as A, B or D although they were all 14 chromosomes, they were slightly, they had slightly different banding patterns. Actually, durum wheat carried A and B banding patterns, and bread wheat carried A, B and D banding patterns. What's going on here? And the explanation is uh, 
given by um, what happens with meiosis. The problem with meiosis for animals uh, hybridizing. This is a horse. This is a donkey. And this is a mule. A horse and a donkey can, can crossbreed and give rise to mules. Mules, however, are sterile. They're hybrids and they're sterile. Why are they sterile? They're very um, powerful, they're resilient like donkeys, and they are um, strong like horses. Uh, they would be they are uh, fantastic uh, workforce animals, but you cannot have mules as uh, progeny of mules. You always have to crossbreed a donkey and a horse. Why? Because in meiosis, horses, donkeys, they group their maternal and parental chromosomes after they replicate together in what we call tetrads. This is what happens in the first mitosis uh, of meiosis, the formation of those tetras. Professor Borger knows a huge amount about this. Um, now, this will, in the first anaphase, split like that. And then in, during the second mitosis, sorry, uh, they will split like this. So gametes will form like this, individual uh, either maternal or paternal chromosomes. Individual, either maternal or paternal chromosomes. Mules cannot form tetrads. And as a result, in meiosis, you can have one, the other, both, neither. Geneticists uh, would, call, uh, would call these defects aneuploidies. So gametes, which are incomplete, or excess numbers of chromosomes normally do not give rise to viable offspring. That's why mules are, uh, are sterile. However, plants can retain both maternal and paternal genomes. We know, in fact, that the maternal genome, the first maternal genome, was the, the, the bee ancestor because we, uh, the cytoplasmic uh, DNA in wheat is the cytoplasmic DNA of the of the uh, bee ancestor. Mm -hmm. This was the maternal. The hybrid retained all full maternal chromosomes and all full paternal chromosomes. So the maternal chromosomes can form tetras with themselves, and so can the paternal chromosomes. And now the hybrid has 28 chromosomes. And this hybridization happened again with another wild uh, cousin, and he gave rise to bread wheat. We can now time these hybridizations, and we know that this, uh, the best estimate is that it happened about half a million years ago. It happened in nature. So these are natural hybrids. And the second one also happened in nature, but probably happened as farmers grew uh, extended uh, ancient weeds, and they cross hybridized with nearby cousins. So this was they were both natural. This, if you want, was unknowingly human facilitated. So farmers unknowingly were selecting polyploids. And polyploids are naturally bigger plants, which produce larger uh, uh, seed or greater quantity of seed. They were uh, using, they were selecting plants which are, were more amenable to uh, farming. Were they genetically modified? not knowingly, but they were selecting something which was not typical in nature. Uh, in fact, they were they later selected things which were very anti-natural. Uh, what is the purpose of a spike of a, of a cereal, of a wild grass, rather? <clears throat> the purpose is to disperse grain, yeah, which is a fruit with a single seed. <clears throat> Is to disperse grain. So for that, it has to uh, be brittle. Yeah, it has to shatter. Domesticated emmer does is not brittle. Does not shatter easily. Of course, uh, this, from the point of view of the farmer, is fantastic because it allows harvesting. From the point of view of the the, the fitness of the grass of the plant, it would be disastrous. It'd be uh, hugely against 
fitness. Uh, it would impair reproduction. But we humans or our ancestors selected it. It was good for us. In fact, <clears throat> farmers did not only select non-brittle spikes, they also selected uh, what we now call naked grain. Uh, basically, the, the uh, individual, these are florets, and they're called florets, they, they contain grain surrounded by some leaves that we call hull. This is hulled grain, this is naked grain. Now, we can make flour very easily from this. We cannot make flour as easily from this, and this produces very, very brown bread. <coughs> Farmers were selecting naked grain. Now, now we think actually brown is better with, with uh, the seed coat and maybe even with the hull. But Again, this, in, uh, which was selected by farmers, in nature would have been detrimental. It matter. It was good. Uh, we didn't know, but it was good for us. Uh, it was good for our ancestors. They selected it. In both cases, we now know, we won't get into details, but uh, master switch or regulatory genes were being selected. Changes in expression of genes that control the expression of other genes. For example, in this case, genes that, that break the spike, that determine uh, brittleness, that allow senescence and, brit and see dispersal. Transcription factors that controls, transcription factors that control the expression of those genes were altered in expression. Our ancestors didn't know that's what they were doing. How about maize? What is the, the wild ancestor of maize? This was actually a question asked for a long time in the 20th century. It turns out these plants here are maize. The wild ancestor of maize turns out to be a weed that often grows in Mexico uh, in maize fields and it's called teosinte. And the reason for the discussion, the long discussion was that the, the plants looks so awfully different. Teosinte is a bushy thing, a bushy plant with lots of stems. <clears throat> it produces tiny, tiny spikes uh, which contain two rows of grain. In fact, that, rain, that grain is encased in a shell which is almost like a nut shell. The grains are small, but they have to be cracked very hard to, to be able to reach the content. Of course, the, the, the spike is, is brittle, it will uh, shatter. Teosinte is com uh, completely different to maize. One big stem, here is one big cob, maybe two big cobs, and those cobs contain, even in old varieties, many rows of seeds, uh, in, in modern ones, many, many more. Those, those seeds, that grain, uh, remains attached to the cob and there's no shell to be seen. Yeah, there's nothing like that shell to be seen. Uh, fantastic for farmers, terrible for the plant if nobody disperses it. Why do we know that this is the ancestor of this? Yeah. Because the two are fully cross fertile. This is teosinte, this is maize, this is a hybrid fully cross fertile. And you see the seeds are now exposed. There are many rows. Uh, the seeds are much more exposed. Somehow, um, some uh, traits of maize are now apparent in this, which is half teosinti. What sorts of uh, changes were farmers selecting for? We actually know that very few key changes were sufficient, something like five key changes were sufficient for the vast majority of the maize phenotype. Hmm. Let's look at one of them, the architecture. We said teosinte is a bushy thing, yeah? Maize is um, a, a plant with a single stem that produces one large cob, sometimes two large cobs, yeah. Completely different. However, here is a maize plant. This is also maize, but it's maize which has lost function of a gene, one gene. This is a mutant plant for this one gene, the teosinte branch gene. Some people call it the branched gene. 
So this plant has lost the function of the teosinte branch gene, which means that when the gene is active, you have a plant that looks like maize. And when you have, when it is inactive, you have a plant that looks like teosinte. What does this gene do? In fact, it is a gene that suppresses the growth of laterals. If we look where the gene is expressed, this dark color suggests where uh, the gene is being active. It, it is being transcribed. It produces mRNA that we can detect with, uh, with a probe that we accompany with a, a dark color. There it is. The TB1, uh, the, bran uh, the branching gene, is active suppressing laterals in maize. And that's why maize looks different from teosinte. But if you lose the gene, then maize looks like teosinte. One single gene. Something similar happened for the, for the shell, the, the, uh, the co cover of the, of the grain, of the kernel. We even know where this happened. Uh, and it happened, we know from tracking multiple uh, populations of teosinte and uh, looking which populations are teosinte, maize is closest to, we know that happened, it happened in southern Mexico, in the valley of the Balsas River. And, and here are the Sinti, uh, uh, spikes from the Balsas River. And here is a Teosinte plant from the Balsas River. And here is John Dobley, uh, who first identified this, who we will see later with a little bit less hair and a little bit lighter color. And here is where hopefully we're going to uh, see him. I'm going to try and uh, uh, this takes a little bit of time, but I think it's very much worth. Please allow me uh, to show you um, two, three minutes of this video. to introduce the maize version of the fruit. Forgive me. Forgive me. One of the main differences between teosinte and maize is that the teosinte seeds are encased in this, this really hard fruit case that makes it really difficult to eat. So clearly that's something that had to change. That's right. And the remarkable thing is that Having a fruit case versus not having a fruit case is basically controlled by a single gene. A single gene? A single gene. To test this gene's function, Dr. Dobley's team did a clever experiment. They carefully crossbred maize and teosinte to introduce the maize version of the fruit case gene into teosinte plants. When they did that, the teosinte kernels, which are normally enclosed in a hard fruit case, became partially exposed almost like little corn kernels. When they did the opposite, putting the teosinte fruitcase gene into maize plants, the fruitcase became larger and started to cover up the maize kernels, similar to teosinte. One gene makes a pretty dramatic change. So another really obvious difference between teosinte and corn is that teosinte produces dozens of these little tiny ears on a plant that branches a lot. Uh, and corn just produces a couple of years on a plant that hardly branches at all. So what's going on there? There is one gene that we've identified that plays a central role in that process, and you call it the branching gene. Dr. Dobley explained how putting the teosinte version of the branching gene into maize made the maize plants more branched, like teosinte. And putting the maize version of the gene into teosinte made the teosinte plants less branched. Dr. Dobley has shown that the fruitcase gene, the branching gene, and just a few others, a small number of genes, just as George Beetle predicted, were responsible for setting in motion all the major differences between maize and teosinte. But how could so few genes cause such huge changes? Why were these genes so powerful? They both belong to a, a special class of genes called regulatory genes. And these are genes that directly regulate the activities of other genes. 
And so when we move the Teosinte version of one of these genes into a corn plant or vice versa, <coughs> we're actually changing more than just that one gene. That's right. They can turn other genes on and off. You could think of these genes as something like uh, the conductor of an orchestra. And if you would take the conductor from one orchestra and give that orchestra, say, a, a new conductor. Just like we did moving some genes from Teosinte to right. A's or vice versa. Right. And you could get a very different quality of music, even though all of the musicians and all the instruments remain the same. These regulatory genes probably influence the activity of hundreds of other genes, which explains how mutations in just a few regulatory genes could dramatically transform Teosinte. But there was still one... Right. <laughs> um, we will post um, the link to that video. If you have 15 uh, minutes, it's beautifully made on the, uh, on the origin of maize, and it summarizes um, several of the strands that we are, we are discussing. <clears throat> now, uh, let, me, uh, let me tell you one example of how farmers um, domesticated rice or transformed rice when they domesticated it. What is rice? We all know, yeah? Um, something that uh, is native to East Asia and Southeast Asia and which uh, grows most frequently on paddy fields. Now, uh, rice grows in its monsoon environment where, where it originally uh, evolved and out of that range. But in, uh, in its natural environment, it grows once a year. It grows under the monsoon uh, rains, which take place in summer. And uh, it uh, begins to grow in spring. It grows fully in summer. It takes full advantage of the water, the high temperatures. And when um, uh, autumn arrives, the dry season approaches, uh, monsoon uh, climates have a very wet season and a dry season. When the dry season approaches, uh, rice flowers or sets grain and, and dries. Now, by growing it in paddy fields, basically what, what we humans are doing is growing on on, on kind of a permanent monsoon, yeah, they are always in the in the sort of permanent rainy season, and because it takes three four months for rice to grow, it is possible to get two even three harvests per year in the same land, not one per year, double triple. But how do plants tell when to flower or when? Uh, or how can that be changed? Rice normally flowers in autumn. If it only flowered in autumn, we couldn't get two or three harvests a year. How do plants tell how to, uh, when to flower? Well, <clears throat> the answer is plants know how long the days are. Plants to uh, the flower in spring, they know that the days are getting longer. Plants that flower in autumn knows that, know that the days are getting shorter. And how do plants tell how long the days are? Well, we can tell ourselves if we, if we have eyes to see light and a watch. Uh, we see light. Uh, what time is it? Seven o'clock. Okay, it's not the middle of winter. What time is it? It's 9 p.m. And is there sun? Yes, there is sun. Oh, we are in the middle of summer because we can see light and we can tell the time independently of light. Can plants do this? Well, they can certainly see light. They have photoreceptors, not just uh, chlorophyll for energy. They have light sensory um, uh, photoreceptors. And do they have a watch? Do they have a watch? Actually, they do. Let me show you a little video uh, to, uh, to uh, prove to you that plants can tell day or night independently of whether there is light of dark or dark. If you train a plant to live in dark light, dark light, and then you put it under a constant low light, uh, for plants like beans that show leaf movements that drop the leaves at night, look what they do. Constant low light. Go to sleep, wake up. Plant is growing, you see. Go to sleep wake up. How beautiful is this? 
Uh, so plants can tell the time. They have an endogenous clock, the circadian clock, the, the, the diurnal, if you want, clock. And we know about genes that build that uh, daily lo day long clock. We know our genes because we can use uh, um, the control regions of genes in front of other genes whose activity we can see, for example, a light emitting protein gene, like a firefly, luciferase. Uh, and plants emit light, depending on what the promoter is, what the control region is, in the morning and go off in the evening, or in the evening and they go off in the morning. What? Day, uh, day length insensitive rice carries clock faults in single genes that make them disregard day length. And this happens for many other out of range crops. Of course, farmers didn't know they were doing this, but they were. And we've done it again and again, not just early farmers that domesticated plants. The Green Revolution, you may have heard of the Green Revolution. Uh, in, the, in the mid 20th century, people predicted, mm -hmm. anthropologists, uh, sociologists, predicted massive famines later in the century as population was exploding, low, uh, high birth rates, and very rapidly declining, fortunately, child mortality rates in the developing world. But the result, huge population explosion. Uh, uh, people predicted massive famines, not enough food uh, for everyone. It never happened. Why? Because of the Green Revolution. And what was the Green Revolution about? It was about irrigation, it was about fertilizers, and about new varieties. Here you have a, new, uh, a rice variety pre-green uh, revolution, 70% straw, only 30% grain. Revolution variety is short. 50% is straw, 50% is grain. And it can also be fertilized without toppling over. So a double benefit. And now we know which genes we, uh, we uh, intervened in without knowing it. A gene involved in hormone res hormonal responses in responses to a, a hormone called gibberellin, were involved in making these plants semi-dwarf, making the Great Revolution possible. We know, and we can now do intentionally, and achieve things in way shorter periods than we would have by traditional breeding. <clears throat> Should we accept biological technology? Many people are reluctant. Um, I think change is never easy, but I think we absolutely sh uh, should. And look, it's easy to see that change has never been easy. You remember Jenner, Jenner the development of vaccines? You know what some people thought at his time? Look, that's Jenner lancing a poor girl with some uh, uh, smallpox uh, infected um, material from a, from a cow. <clears throat> And look what people think uh, is happening. Look, look, developing horns, developing tails, yeah, uh, things coming out of their trousers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, look at look at the look at the squirting of the lands. Yeah, this is how some people cartooned, mocked vaccination 200 years ago. What would it be of us without it now? Have you seen these parodies of the Oxford vaccine, yeah, uh, which comes from a, a chimp a cold virus? It is not new. It's been going on for 200 years. But are we not playing God? Well, remember Michelangelo, the Sixteen Chapel. Um, are we humans not touched with, um, with God's ability to uh, create, to improve, are we not supposed to? And here we have two examples of people playing God. You will recognize that face. Uh, I think Sarah Gilbert, uh, the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine developer, or uh, Norman Borlau, you would not know, the, the father of the Green Revolution in wheat. So I, I, I leave the question with you. <laughs> Are we not supposed to be playing God? Thank you very much, and uh, sorry we've we've got pretty much uh, to the to the very end of our time. No, Enrique, no, you have Enrique, never you been have so never... spot on. <laughs>
and was a beautiful lecture. Thank you so much. So any questions straight on or you want to digest this lot of information and uh, and uh, both uh, as a message, as a, as a science? Any questions? <laughs> or if not, then we, we digest and uh, we do put put up uh, the PowerPoint and uh, and also the links of the videos which were fantastic as well <laughs> as good as the lecture <laughs> Enrique and uh, so thank you so much and uh, just an advert that uh, next week actually we invited a colleague from the geology department to talk to us so he will be talking about oceans and the sediments of the oceans so i hope that uh, that everybody will join us and uh, we can even invite the geology department students uh, to enjoy a geology biology cross talk <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> thanks thanks, thanks. thanks thank you thanks thanks everyone thank you mm -hmm.